This module is a case history of the design and construction of a new embankment dam. And the new embankment was to replace one that had been overtopped and breached. Learning objectives for this module. I'm gonna review the project goals of this case history. Explore the existing site features and how they influence the embankment design, and then go on to, to discuss um, major embankment design features and some of the design challenges that the design team had faced. Going to go over the typical embankment dam design cross section and the rationale behind the, using that cross section, and then look at on site materials and how they are integrated into design. And I'm going to end the presentation going through uh, some of the construction. Uh, this project has been completed through construction. So I'll show you some construction photos as well. So the uh, existing um, site itself, again, there was an existing embankment dam. It was a homogeneous earth fill embankment, had a structural height of about 27 feet. About uh, 970 feet long, it had a maximum storage capacity of of just 640 acre feet, so a very small embankment. The upstream slope um, was uh, three horizontal to one vertical. The downstream slope, which is shown in this photograph, um, was steep. It was one and a half to one to two and a half to one. There was a low level slide gate controlled outlet that went through the embankment near the center of the, center of the dam, and then a concrete OG type uh, spillway off on the left abutment of the existing dam. So due to a large storm event, um, the, the inflows were too great to be passed through the spillway, so the dam overtopped and breached. Um, and that's what you're seeing in the photos here. This breach width of, along the top was on the order of uh, 200 feet out of the 970 feet. And where the embankment overtop, but it didn't quite breach, there was just a remnant of the dam crest left, as you can see in this right photo, uh, with, the, with the flow going in this direction. So the design team decided after this, that when they first got involved with the project, that it was um, because so much of the embankment had been uh, breached, it was a, a bit of an older embankment that had some issues that we'll discuss in a minute. It was decided just to take the entire embankment out and then reconstruct a new embankment dam as well as a new spillway and an integral outlet works. And then to, uh, to bring everything up to current design standards. So the team, the design team assembled all the subsurface information that had been collected to date and looked at where there was gaps in that data and decided that uh, they're going to install uh, and drill uh, 13 additional borings that were uh, along the embankment alignment. And then the, I want to mention right off that the, the uh, center line of the old embankment, uh, the new embankment matched the old embankment. There was a, um, a highway that went across the embankment itself. So that's why the alignment was the same. So 13 new borings. Um, upstream and downstream and along the center line, and then nine additional borings that were in association with the, the new spillway structure. Uh, split spoon samples were collected um, and with uh, SPT blow counts, uh, as well as uh, Selby tubes. So here is a cross section, typical cross section uh, of the embankment. Um, here is the, uh, the after failure surface in this one particular cross section that didn't completely breach, but you can see a lot of the material was removed. This was the, uh, the shape of the old embankment. So um, the yellow, shading in yellow is more sandier material. Uh, red is uh, more gravelly, and then the green is our lean clays. So you can see from, from this, typical cross section that the embankment was uh, mainly clay sand and low plastic clay. Uh, the foundation was mainly silty sands, poorly graded sands and low plastic clays as well. Um, and the upper five to 10 feet 
was a very uh, loose sand uh, and soft clay deposit that we'll talk about here in, in a little bit in terms of, uh, of how that material was treated. This is a profile along the embankment. This is the left abutment and the right abutment. And here is the breach itself. And then the dam crest here. Again, this is about 200 feet wide across the top of the breach. Uh, just showing the same uh, deposits that we just showed earlier as far as the embankment and foundation materials. There was two borrow areas that were uh, on government property that were available to use on the project uh, for the embankment material, as well as salvaging the existing embankment material. As I said, it was the existing, existing embankment was to be removed and then that material could be reused. The upper five to 10 feet of, the, uh, of this uh, primary borough area was a mainly silty sand. Uh, that was uh, salvaged for shell material as it's uh, stronger, uh, but uh, a bit more pervious. And then this mainly clay sand uh, below that uh, deposit was used for the core because it's more impervious. So going into the evaluation, into the design, this upper cross section was a preliminary design that showed the excavation of the potential liquefiable material uh, with a clay core and then uh, shell material. Um, and, and these uh, CW cross sections were done at uh, assuming steady state uh, conditions and at a PMF level. Uh, you can see slightly below the dam crest. So without any chimney filter or, or blanket uh, filter in here, the, um, the, the phreatic surface nearly intersected the downstream slope of the shell material. The final cross section which again showed the excavation of, of uh, the potential liquefiable material, but it added the a chimney filter uh, and the uh, filter blanket. You can see the phreatic surface drops um, um, through the uh, core itself and then into the blanket and then into the tow drain. Now um, for a stability analysis, the uh, design team looked at the typical load cases for any embankment, um, looked at long-term steady state, both upstream and downstream slope stability, the rapid drawdown on the upstream slope, as well as at the end of construction, uh, um, immediate load case. So the values that we're, we're showing here are the, um, the uh, steady state, conditions and then assumed at the uh, PMF pool level, which is certainly a conservative assumption that we reach a steady state during a PMF. But um, this this upper figure was with uh, a homogeneous embankment with not uh, any removal of that, that uh, upper soft and, and uh, loose deposit. And the factor of safety was uh, 1.2, which is unacceptable. Uh, minimum factor of safety required is 1.5 for the uh, static steady uh, state. Over on this uh, uh, this figure um, included the chimney and the blanket filter, as well as the tow drain, and that factor of safety for a circular failure surface, the minimum was 2.25, which was acceptable. Also, a non uh, uh, Non-circular uh, failure surface was also um, performed for the failure surface um, using this, the same loading, that is the PMF loading, um, with a with the filter uh, chimney and blanket drain. You can see the factor of safety for that case was 2.24, the minimum factor of safety. That failure surface um, intersected a uh, a soft. Uh, lean clay deposit, and uh, that's where this horizontal surface was. And I want to just mention that any time that you, particularly if you have a, a horizontal uh, softer deposit, you want to make sure that you run a um, um, a non-circular failure surface 
to uh, to check against your failure surface because in this case it was just it was the critical case by by just point oh one but um, you still want to run that case so additional analyses that were done uh, seismic evaluation uh, was done both deterministic and probabilistic uh, using class d uh, stiff soil for the seismic uh, uh, class the uh, maximum credible earthquake the mce that was used was a two percent probability of exceedance in 50 years which had a return period of 2475 years that came out with a peak ground acceleration of 0.24 g now that mce loading was used then in the liquefaction evaluation and again i mentioned that that upper five to ten feet of the foundation soil consisted of saturated loose sands silty sands and soft clay sands those spt n values range from zero to five blows per foot so uh, very um, very loose and uh, weak deposit the, the the lower foundation layer uh, that was underlying that that soft and loose deposit had a, had much higher much stiffer and higher densities as spt n, n values were ranged from about 19 to greater than 50 blows per foot so using that mce peak ground acceleration uh, the triggering analysis without removing the weak foundation deposit indicated a factor of safety of less than one so it was determined that that five to ten feet of that, that weak material foundation material had to be removed and replaced so this is a view looking uh, upstream so this is the right abutment um, the design team assembled uh, really a, a three-dimensional evaluation with using all of the um, all of the uh, boring data as well as some CPT were also collected at the site to look at those soft sand deposits and determine that uh, a three-foot over excavation towards the spillway was required. The center part of the embankment, um, the foundation had to be excavated 10 feet deep and over on the left side five feet deep again to remove those potential liquefiable materials additional analysis that were done settlement analysis uh, due to the removal of that that uh, that soft foundation layer that upper layer the post-construction settlement was estimated to be only an inch when you added the uh, the one percent camber of the uh, i'm sorry the one percent settlement of the embankment itself you had a, a, a total settlement of, of around three to four inches but as we uh, Brian had gone through the uh, camber evaluation and settlement module earlier um, six percent six inches of camber was used instead of uh, of the three or four inches which is the typical minimum filter compatibility analysis was also performed um, that c33 sand which we have discussed earlier uh, was uh, was uh, found to be filter compatible with both the core and the foundation material and the ASTM uh, 89 stone was uh, found to be compatible with the C33 sand and that was used adjacent to the, the tow drain pipe so here's a site layout um, this is looking in the downstream direction left abutment right abutment spillway off on the right abutment it was uh, realigned to better line up with the uh, stream channel and the outlet works gate actually is on the the right side of the the structure is pointing in the wrong wrong place here but that was uh, integral with the spillway itself so if you recall I mentioned earlier that the existing outlet uh, of the site prior to the dam being breached and prior to reconstruction was near the center of the embankment so it created a penetration through the embankment uh, anytime that you can remove a, a failure mode um, it certainly is uh, part of the design that you should uh, carefully consider in this case integrating and putting that um, outlet works integral with with the spillway itself eliminated that, that penetration and eliminating any potential failure modes which is a one of the common failure modes for any embankment dam is a penetration through the embankment itself 
So here's a typical cross section uh, of the designed in, uh, new embankment. Again, we have the excavation of the potential liquefiable material, um, the, uh, the clay core, a uh, 10 foot uh, wide clay core at the top. Uh, we had the, the, the chimney, which uh, was five feet wide. It was uh, wa that width for constructability as well as potential offsets um, from uh, earthquake loading. And that any flow that was collected from that or from the foundation would go into the, um, the blanket filter. And it was a three foot um, thick blanket filter. Again, that was sized to collect the amount of seepage from both the, the uh, through the chimney as well as the foundation uh, and then being collected into the two stage tow drain. Another thing to point out um, about the filter is that this protects the foundation. It was placed on the foundation, which is similar to a case history that I'll discuss about Green Ridge Glade Dam. Always important design feature when you expose the foundation to protect it. One thing that you may be wondering about is why the dam crest is 44 feet wide. Well, this had um, we required to have a bike lane and a sidewalk as well as shoulders of the road and it was paved access. So that's why it is such a a robust cross-section in terms of the width of the dam crest. So going into a construction now, um, the, the, the Cofferdam and Diversion Plan, it was actually a two-phase approach. So the, the first phase was to construct the, the cofferdams uh, to protect the embankment construction work and then put a, a temporary diversion channel and then to also put a cofferdam around the new spillway. So during this, um, the lake itself, any inflows would go through uh, the diversion channel. The, the second phase was that once the new spillway was, was completed to remove this section of cofferdam and then divert flows uh, through the new spillway and then to close off um, uh, put a cofferdam across the, the upstream side of the diversion channel, and then con construct the embankment, con uh, complete the embankment, and then uh, particularly this connection here, um, and then uh, remove the cofferdams. So this is a photo of the excavated uh, foundation down to a, that firmer foundation. And you just note that that there was an extensive dewatering system that was required to construct the, the project in the dry and then uh, well points, uh, closely spaced well points were used to dewater uh, the system. It was also a proof rolling of the subgrade that was performed to identify any so soft or loose deposits that, that may impact the performance of the dam, that is to cause differential settlement um, have unstable fill above the subgrade. And the um, there was, it found, as you can see here, there was some areas that were found to be loose and the, uh, we over-excavated a maximum of two feet deep in some locations and then replaced that with compacted embankment fill. So uh, we discussed, discussed earlier about foundation mapping and it's a, a, a very important part of any, any project is to make sure you map your foundation, whether it's uh, soil or rock. So uh, in this case, the, um, uh, the proof rolling and observations and over excavations, those were all mapped um, by a, uh, a USACE geologist. And again, foundation mapping is critical. It's really the only time that that foundation hopefully will ever be exposed. So you need to document, uh, carefully document um, any, uh, uh, particularly if any issues that come up in the, in the future, like uh, seepage or settlement or cracking, and that you can use them then for future risk assessments or future modifications. So you can see over excavated areas were mapped here. That's that um, uh, cross hatched area, as well as um, all of the different foundation uh, materials were carefully mapped. Here's a photo 
looking towards the right abutment, this is the upstream shell material, the core and the filter blanket. One thing to note in this photo is that you can see the filter blanket was kept slightly above the core to, to reduce the potential for contamination of the fines uh, of the core into the filter blanket. Another thing to note, it looks like some, uh, some wheeled equipment went over the core. So um, one thing that the, uh, what, what had occurred on this project prior to adding more fill on top of this, it was scarified uh, to about two inches deep uh, or as, as deep to get this smooth surface off um, and then place material on top of that to, to ensure that there is no seepage path because they would create a seepage path uh, through the embankment and potential weak zone across the embankment as well uh, if it was to be um, material was to be placed on this surface. So I mentioned in an earlier presentation about the trenching method uh, to be used for a chimney filter. And this is only if there's a single stage. In this case, that was the, the designers decided that to only go with, uh, because of the low head dam, uh, would have enough capacity that that chimney filter that a, uh, a, a chimney drain would not be required. So in order to place that trenching method, as you recall from the previous presentation, from the foundation uh, in eight inch loose lifts, you uh, place up to about four feet of embankment material and then excavate down um, back to the foundation in this case, and then place in, and again in thin lifts, place the uh, sand uh, up to be slightly above the top of the uh, adjacent fill, and then repeat that process, um, com construct your fill back up in, in uh, eight inch loose lifts, say about four feet, above and then excavate down uh, to contact that old sand, make sure that that, uh, that previously placed sand and make sure there's no contamination, um, remove any any of that and then uh, place thin lifts and uh, moisture condition it and uh, build your chimney up in that uh, manner. Another view of, uh, of the uh, fill that is being compacted, it was done with a uh, with a, um, a sheep's foot or a tamping foot uh, roller. Um, this is the this is the, the spillway. So this is being compacted next to the spillway itself. Uh, these walls were slightly battered uh, for more effective compaction um, in, instead of having vertical walls. And then within three to four feet of the structure itself, uh, walk behind type compactors were used. The, the material, the, uh, the, uh, the shell and core material were placed at or slightly above optimum for, for a good bond against the wall. And um, um, thin lifts were used as well, uh, four inch thick loose lifts. Just another shot of the labyrinth. I just want to show you that. Um, so it's a little bit more complete. Again, this is the bay. This is looking downstream. This is where the uh, new outlet works um, uh, gate would be installed. So this is a photo aerial view of the site. Uh, looks like the spillway is almost complete. The uh, labyrinth spillway uh, is, is in place and the, uh, and the training walls have been constructed but some of the downstream work and riprap has not been placed at this point. Coffer dams are still in place, but the embankment construction looks like it's uh, moving along. Temporary diversion channel is still in place at this point. Now we're nearing completion. Now you see that um, the coffer dams have been removed. All the inflows are going through the new spillway. Uh, Topsoil is being placed. There, uh, the pavement on the dam crest has not occurred yet and guardrail still needs to be put uh, along adjacent to the uh, dam crest. So here is the, the uh, lake uh, mostly filled up, uh, close to normal pool. Um, there was a first fill plan that was prepared uh, for this project that um, recorded um, and documented observations as well as instrumentation readings and evaluated that instrumentation readings as the lake was coming up. 
if it was uh, a higher new embankment or a uh, modification to an existing embankment, you'd oftentimes uh, require um, waiting periods or holding periods of your pool. And then you would oftentimes hold the pool at a, at a given lower elevation for say at least one to two weeks, make observations, read instrumentation, evaluate that instrumentation, and make sure it's performing as designed prior to raising the lake any higher. You want to identify um, any potential issues like seepage or movement or cracks that may form in abnormal instrumentation readings prior to uh, bringing the uh, reservoir up higher because uh, it would be critical to ensure the safety of the dam uh, before the reservoir is completely filled. So you do it in stages, the reservoir is raised in stages. So uh, we've gone through all these uh, learning objectives, reviewing the goals, looking at the site features, the uh, major embankment design features and typical embankment sections in the on-site use of materials. So thank you very much for your attention.